Do you want me to start with my uh, presentation? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to be talking about the Internet Panopticon and it show that why we're all prisoners of the Internet Panopticon. It's very difficult to escape from it. The Panopticon was developed and designed by the founder of modern utilitarianism in the late 18th century, Jeremy Bentham. He spent about 60 years at the concept of the building, which was part of his suggestions concerning legal and social reforms. The building structure could be applied to a great variety of institutions, from factories, by hospitals, to schools and asylums. But Bentham spent most of his time developing the architecture of the prison. The project was not realized together with Bentham. However, later on, several prisons and factories were constructed on the basis of his model in all parts of the world. The name Panopticum was inspired by Agus Panoptes, a giant with a hundred eyes from Greek mythology. Agus most probably means something like bright, and Panoptes means all seen. Some of his eyes were permanently awake, as he knew that being asleep can be deadly. Hence, he was an excellent watchman, and one of his tasks was to take care of Ego, a mortal, who was turned into a cow by Hera, because Hera realized that her husband Zeus had an interest in Ego. It might be interesting to know that by playing the flute, Hermes, the son of Zeus, managed to set Argus Panoptes asleep, so that Hermes, Hermes was able to kill him. To commemorate the watchman, Hera preserved the eyes in the peacock's tail, according to Obi, and her chariot was pulled by the peacocks. Here, the watchman played a role in an erotic conflict between Zeus and Hera. The above mentioned architectures have the purpose of fulfilling a watchman role between guards and the prisoners, or the factory owners and factory workers. Today, the Internet Panopticon is a central relationship between economic leaders and the consumers and political leaders and their citizens, as I explained later. What is special about the building Panopticon by Bentham is that it represents a means for a permanent cost-effective surveillance. The panopticum is a circular building with many see-through cells which are flooded with light and they have windows on the inside and, and the outside of the circle. In the center of the circular building is a tower which is dark in the inside and only has little see-through holes. Consequently, the inmates know that all of their acts can be watched at any time. However, they never know when they are actually being watched, as the eyes of the watchman who is in the inside of the dark tower cannot be seen by the prisoners. Consequently, such a prison requires fewer staff, which makes the prison cheaper to run than traditional such institutions. Independent of the surveillance, which is actually taking place, people who permanently could be watched and are aware of this being the case, internalize the power relationship connected to the system and start centering their own acts. This is what Michel Foucault's analysis of such a structure as he described it in his monograph Discipline and Punish. He says, he who is subjected to a field of visibility and who knows it assumes responsibility for the constraint of power. He makes him play spontaneously upon himself. He inscribes in himself the power relation in which he simultaneously plays both roles. He becomes the principle of his own subjection. Foucault identifies the state with the per per word panopticism. Constant visibility maximizes the efficiency of the institution. According to him, the increasing amount of such control systems within Western societies from the 18th century onwards increased the likelihood of social conformity of their citizens, as people who are in such a state start censoring and disciplining themselves. 
It must be noted that this book by Foucault was published in 1975. The basic protocols of the internet as we know it today were only developed in 1981. The commercialization of the internet only began around 1990 when the US American National Science Foundation decided to use the internet also for commercial purposes. However, the digital world we live in is a panopticon which applies to and it closes all citizens of affluent societies. And there's no way of escaping the system due to the permanent increase of digitalization within more and more domains of our live world. And in a longer talk um, of that presentation, I could now sort of summarize all the developments which are taking place. I guess I'll, I'll just um, give a description of three most important areas. So firstly, everything we enter into, into the internet, especially search engines like Google, the emails we are sending, um, they, they represent part of our psychology, part of our personality. So um, our personality data gets, gets, gets digitalized. Secondly, we are being surveyed by, by means of face de detection. Uh, we can already be detected on photos, even uh, photos being taken from behind. This is a system Facebook developed. And uh, uh, by means of the uh, public surveying system, and all of our movements, like the GPS and our telephone companies, all of our movements can be traced. So firstly, there's like personality being digitalized, secondly, our movements being digitalized, and thirdly, it's, it's, and that's what's forthcoming in the, in the next, will be particularly relevant in the, in the future, in the near future, it's our physiological data, our data, data concerning our um, biometrical data, by means of fitness apps, we all um, Google Fit, um, we, we give our data freely to, to Google, to, to our insurance companies, um, and thereby um, uh, um, our physiological data, information concerning our health will also become available digitally. And all of this digital data is being transferred via the inter inter internet and in the internet, there are certain nodal points, and the biggest nodal point is, is the one in, is, is one in, in Frankfurt, and most of the information flies by this nodal point. And basically, any hacker, anyone, any a national security institution, anyone who has access to this nodal point could, could, could get hold of the information concerning our personality, concerning our physiology, and concerning our movements. And thereby, if, if someone was able to connect all this data, some people claim it's possible by 90% to even predict a person's actions, and that's that's a challenge we need to we need to we need to tell it. Uh, we need to that's a challenge we need to face. And how should we deal with it? Well, well very often when I when I talk about this, uh, the initial response is we need to drop out, dropping out. We need to get rid of technology and leave civilization, but that is not not a realistic option. Purpose. Solves this challenge um, in, in the Greek myth by playing the flute so that the child with a hundred eyes can fall asleep and can be killed. However, this is not an appropriate solution. Neither by getting rid of emerging technologies or by leaving technologically advanced societies and retreat in nature can, be, can the program resolve. Because such reactions do not adequately consider the advantages we've gained from living in a technologically advanced society. The initial reaction to the above mentioned developments, I'm retreating in nature. I'm leaving these type of societies. I'm not using smartphones, computers, Facebook, and Google. Then this is not a realistic option because the advantages related to technological processes must not be forgotten. Technologically advanced countries, the ones in Europe, North America, and Australia, are also the ones in which the average lifespan is highest. More than 80 years both for men as well as for women. To live in a technologically less advanced country like the one of the countries in southern parts of Africa is much more problematic, as here the average lifespan is less than 40 years. Advances concerning our lifespan, or as I prefer to refer to it, with respect to our health span, are closely connected to our technological advances. If it's in our interest to live without the benefits which come along with these advances, dropping out would be an option. I think that for most people, this is not a realistic option. 
using a mobile phone instead of a smartphone or similar decisions is not a decision either. Because thereby we are also leaving many digital traces and what is still part of other digital systems like public surveillance cameras, insurance systems, health systems. The increased health spend is merely one reason why dropping out is not a realistic solution for most people. We value living long and healthy lives. It might not be a universally valid constituent of a good life, but it's at least a widely shared element. Two and two years ago we didn't have antibiotics, anesthetics and vaccinations. Now these biotechnologies are available. And many of us and I would not be, uh, longer be here right now without these technologies. So it's important to realize that we've always been using technologies to make our lives better or longer. Education, literacy, and vaccinations are, are such technologies, and it's good that we have money, many of these technologies. So the internet also provides us with many significant advantages which we not, do not with, wish to give up anymore. However, the question is how to deal with the internet panopticon, a giant with a hundred eyes, while preserving or guaranteeing a type of privacy or bio, bio privacy as well. Which, so my suggestions are a freedom and anonymity and chaos. So I must admit that I have not had fully convincing answers yet to the question of how to treat the giant with a hundred eyes. The least this talk is supposed to provide is an initial stimulus to realizing the relevance of this question. However, not attempting to give a reply is not a satisfying position to take either. Hence, I'm attempting to put forward at least some guidelines which provide, uh, might provide a basis for further reflection and practical development. So the following three guidelines might be helpful initial health hints for initializing a movement into a better direction. Firstly, freedom. By promoting a radically plural government because of the risks associated and connected to internet crime. A more realistic option would be a state regulated anonymizing software, which would make it more difficult for foreign governments getting hold of data from citizens of a respective state. In this case, only some governmental members would have the option of breaking the anonymity. Even though such a solution might reduce the risk related to economic espionage, it's not a way of getting rid of the internet panopticon. Still, given the great variety of privacy standards in the great variety of countries in the world, it might be a way of reducing the global degree of mass surveillance. The Swiss art collective entitled Medienkruppe Picnic created a fascinating work of art in which they dealt with the issue of anonymity in the internet by creating a program a logarithm entitled Random Darknet Shopper, which had a weekly budget, budget of 100 years of US dollar in Bitcoin for randomly buying things in the darknet and having them delivered to the Kunsthalle in Basel. The project was stopped by Swiss police. However, the artists were not punished because the value of the work of art was realized and acknowledged. The things they bought were returned to the artist so that they can be put on display in the museum. Solely some ecstasy pills which were bought were destroyed by the police. The darknet represents a way of promoting anonymity as a specific part of the internet. The third and final solution is chaos. If one's digital data is full of inconsistencies, self-contradictory information and other types of information, machines cannot fulfill their tasks properly anymore. Chaos needs to be created well, so that the separation of the white noise from the proper information is difficult, if not an impossible task. By chaos, I do not refer to the great of my, uh, amount of seemi seemingly unstructured data, but I refer to the inclusion and creation of fake data and mock data to undermine the possibility of data mining. The Metabody project is actually a fascinating and praiseworthy attempt, in particular in, particular in that respect, um, in, uh, also for dealing with contemporary technological challenges with, uh, while undermining aspects as of these developments by promoting chaos, a more of becoming and permanent processes which move beyond dualities and cannot sensibly be analyzed by means of categorical dualities. It's a basic logical insight that everything follows from self-contradictory premises. 
So hence, the information derived in this way cannot be used in the standard way and are of no relevance for traditional analysis of the associated information like data mining. The short conclusion. Even though I'm aware that the three final suggestions for preserving the kind of privacy might sound way in the way, and I think they hit into the right direction. By presenting the above reflection, the least I'm hoping for is to stimulate a wider permanent and conscious awareness of the state in which we're living, and the problematic consciousness connected to systems in the internet production. I very much hope they will find an integrated way of enjoying the benefits of our technical process while we do not have to continue living in the synoptic prison. Thanks a lot for your attention.